Good evening, good evening everyone and welcome. Shall we begin with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening thankful for all the blessings, for being with us throughout the day. We pray now that you'll be with Elder Bright as he breaks to us a bread of life. We also pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide, to teach, to help us learn, to retain, to share in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Going to start off with a song called There Is Only One. United in the truth of Jesus, we'll go forward in the strength of the Lord. To be caught up in man-made traditions is just something we cannot afford. There is only one truth and that is found in the Bible. Some preachers like to preach on fables Teach you things that simply are not right So if they don't teach the truth of Jesus It's because they have no light There is only one truth and that is found in the Bible So when they tell you many roads lead to heaven, only Jesus has the key to let us in. Some may tell you that you must obey them. Saying they have found new light But when the traditions of men Conflict with the word of God We must do what is right So when they tell you many roads lead to heaven, only Jesus has the key to let us in. So when they tell you many roads There's only one road that leads to heaven. And Jesus has the key 
to let us in. Amen. Welcome everyone. Welcome Albert Bright. The time is yours. We look forward to the message of the evening. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Um, once again, thank you for sharing that um, wonderful song with us. Um, thank you all for um, joining us this evening as we continue with our studies, uh, which is lessons from Israel, lessons from Israel. Um, if we can uh, bow our heads as we petition the throne above. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for sustaining the meetings and sustaining us, Lord, even um, this evening. And Lord, as we've been looking at um, the histories of the past and looking at the gospel and looking at how your son was sent and the impact that he made to his church and to the world, Lord, help us to see that is the very same thing with the third angel's message. As it does its work in us, Lord, and it ripples out into the world, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we do not fight against this message, that we um, will proclaim the third angel's message, even with a loud voice, that those, um, even in the other churches, those, as the Bible calls, in other folds, will hear your voice, and because they know your voice, will stand um, with God's people, Lord, at the end. Thank you, Lord, for your care and your grace towards us today as we have been in various places carrying out our various duties. But we thank you for your faithfulness and we ask that you may continue to be with us this evening. Please um, waken us, give us strength of mind um, that we may be able to follow even this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, as we've been looking at the time of Christ, and yesterday we looked at, you know, the purpose as to why God um, told Israel to build a sanctuary, build a temple, and that this was an object lesson in which God was trying to teach them or teach his people as well as teaching us today of how he wants to dwell in us. And he was revealing, um, you know, through the sanctuary system and all these things, his purpose of why he created man and the high destiny, really, that he had for man. And what we hopefully saw yesterday was that, you know, there's two contending spirits seeking to possess the temple, which is the body, the mind, and so forth. And... At the end, only one will have full supremacy. Either it will be the Holy Spirit or it will be another spirit. But even now, as we stand, even now, as we're in this meeting, let us be aware that there's actually two forces contending. Let us be aware that the enemy, and we're told by inspiration, you know, does not yield even an inch of ground. And as we look at today's study, and we're looking at the stronghold of the temple, you know, as we're carrying on with the same theme, we'll see, you know, how far Satan is actually looking to take us. And he takes us to a point, or his purpose is to take us to a point of no return. Same with God. God works in us. He, um, The power of grace comes to our lives. And, you know, through sanctification, God looking to transform us and renew us renew our character transform us back into the image to the point of no return when i mean no return to the point where we will sin no more this is where god is seeking to take us likewise satan is also working to take us to a point of no return and that point of no return is the point where we'll blaspheme the holy spirit the point of no return is when you know when when michael stands up and he says you know he that is unjust let him be unjust you know he that is holy let him be holy still uh, a point where you know there is no more um conversions to be made you know probation is closed there's a point where no more apostasy will be taking place because both sides have been made up 
those who have the seal of God, no more return to the to to sin and rebelliousness, and those who receive the mark of the beast who, who will no longer have the opportunity to repent and return to the Lord. So this this is where this controversy is pushing us, and we're looking at the time of Christ, and we can see we can see almost as types, right, as types in the time of Christ as to um, what these two spirits, these two principles, the mystery of God and the mystery of iniquity, is is seeking to do with the individual. Now, to begin with, I want to ask a question, and the question is really, is what is a stronghold? <clears throat> what is a stronghold? Um, in the Bible, you have um, strongholds, which sometimes um, depicted as towers or tower of strength um a fortress okay a fortress stronghold tower of strength um you know what are these things um i'd like to just share my screen with you all okay and hopefully you can see what i am seeing if you are, let me know. Yes, we can see the screen. Yes, excellent. Okay, and hopefully it's big enough um, for you guys to see. So, a stronghold fortress. Now, Webster's dictionary um, depicts it as a fastness, a fortified place, a place of security. Okay, so um, in ancient days, you have certain strongholds which were placed in strategic places built in strategic places as a place of defense okay and in these strongholds of fortresses um you would keep things of um value or importance um and again you know it was a place of um defense in, against enemy attack uh so <clears throat> so it could be you know a fortress or even a castle um this is windsor castle okay and when you look at fortresses, they're built um, in a way that it's not easily to be overrun. You know, you cannot overrun it easily. And so, you know, this is the idea of a fortress or a stronghold, a place where you can um, attack from and retreat and, um, you know, you can get re-ammunition and so forth and so forth i'm sure you get the drift so we're told in um inspiration that the church is god's fortress which he holds in a world in revolt and we'll look at that um passage now firstly you know the bible actually depicts god as a fortress we're just going to look at a few passages we're going to look at a few passages in the scriptures um if you go with me to um psalms chapter 18 psalms chapter 18 verses 2 and then we'll go to psalm 71 verse 3 so psalms chapter 18 verses 2 speaks about god as a defense or a a tower of strength or a fortress and the Bible says in Psalms chapter 18, verses two, it says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Now, this is very um, significant because in ancient times, as we know, whether it was Egypt, whether it was Babylon, um, the cities were built in a way that it was deemed impregnable, right? That you cannot overrun it. And so here David is actually saying, you know, the invisible God, he is the one that's actually my strength and my fortress. Now that's actually very counterintuitive to what the thought was in those days. Because again, as we saw yesterday, um, the Jews um, fell for the trap of wanting to be like the other nations. The other nations, um, they felt that their strength was in how much horses and chariots they had. They placed their strength upon the, the cities and the fortresses that they built. But the Hebrew mind was, you know, 
different because their strength was in an invisible God, right? Um, how do you place your your faith in a God that you don't see, per se? So let's go to Psalms chapter 71, verses 3. Psalms chapter 71, verses 3. Psalms chapter 71, verses 3. The Bible says, oops, I think I got that wrong. Oh, I went to Psalm 73, pardon me. So Psalm 71, verse 3 says, Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Okay, here we see it again. God, um, David, speaking about God, says, you know, be um, be in my strong habitation. And you have given me commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Um, David is learning these lessons, you know, while he was fleeing from Saul, while he's going into the wilderness, while he's hiding in caves and so forth. He understands that God is God is his strength and his fortress. Um, let's go to Psalms chapter 144, 144, verse 2. Actually, we'll start from verse 1. Psalms 144, verses 1 and 2. And the Bible says, Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teacheth my hand to war and my fingers to fight, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower, and my deliverer, my shield, and he whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. Again, now David is a fighting man, right? David is a, is a warrior. But here he understands, he's telling you, he understands that God is his fortress, God is his high tower, and his deliverer. Okay, so again, this is counterintuitive to the times, to, to what was the thought in those times. When you look at some of the... Um, um, depictions of ancient Babylon or the um, the um, the Philistines and 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 those um, you know heathen nations in what in you know where they place their trust in the in the idols and in their in their um, fortresses and so forth you know they depended on something which they saw and God was trying to teach His people that. You know, the strength is not in what you can see. Like we saw yesterday, many of the children of Israel saw the miracles. They saw Pharaoh's army being destroyed. When they, they yet in seeing all these manifestations, they still had unbelief. And many of them did not, obviously, the majority did not go into the promised land. When you go take it to the time of Christ, as we we'll, we continue have been looking at the, um, this, this, um, the past few days, the how many miracles does Christ perform? He performed many miracles in the sight of men. Um, but how many people believed on him? You know, when Jesus, you know, did the miracle of ra raising Lazarus from death, that was the very thing which caused many of the scribes and Pharisees to come together and say, listen, we have to put this man to death. So miracles and going by sight is not what saves you. Faith is not built by sight, but faith is built by the word of God. Okay? And this is the lesson that God was teaching in the Old Testament, and this was the lesson that Christ came to teach um, to the Jewish nation, and it's the same lesson that God is teaching us today. You know, there's a lot of... There's the um, prosperity gospel, right? The prosperity gospel basically is saying that, you know, um, when the a sign that god is blessing you is 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 by you know wealth and riches that again which you see um but they don't see the blessing of what the holy spirit brings to the inner man you know that's not and and they don't see the blessing of really the reward which is the character of christ when god spoke to abraham if you go with me to a um genesis chapter 15 just quickly genesis chapter 15 genesis chapter 15 Verse 1, Genesis 15, verse 1, the Bible says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield 
and thy exceeding great reward. Same lesson. I am thy great reward. Um, how is God the reward of Abraham? Now, normally when we think about Abraham and inheritance, which is the reward, we think about the land, again, the, 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 the things that we see, the land is, and so forth. But God mm -hmm. says, no, he is the reward. Now, how is God the reward? How is God the inheritance? What is it that you inherit from your parents? You inherit you inherit your characteristics from your parents. And here Christ, and God is saying to Abraham, you know, my character is actually the great reward. Why? Because in this controversy, Satan wants what God has. He wants the throne. He wants heaven. He wants, um, you know, dominion. But he does not want God's character. He doesn't see any glory in God's character. But that's the highest reward. You know, um, we want to have the new heavenly bodies, correct? We don't want the body, this body that suffers, that feels aches and pains, that grows old and dies. We want the new body. But we must have the character of God first, the mind of Christ first. That, that's what we must have. Because if we have a he heavenly body with our minds as it is, we'll just be demons. So in, before we can inherit the body, before we can inherit Canaan, we must have the character of Christ first. Before the children of Israel can inherit um, the, um, Canaan, the earthly Canaan, God had to what um, drive out the Canaanites. If the Canaanites could not in, um, maintain that land in iniquity, there was no way that the children of Israel would possess that land in iniquity. They had to go through a process of conversion before they, they could inherit the land. And this is the lesson that God was trying to teach us. So going back to the stronghold, let's go to Nahum chapter 1. The book of Nahum chapter 1. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7. And the Bible says, the Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust him. Amen. So God is, we're told, is a stronghold in the day of trouble. Is there a day of trouble that's coming? Is there a, a day of trouble um, that's coming upon the world? A time of trouble such as never was. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, there is a day of trouble. But we're told that God is our strength, our stronghold in that day of trouble. But for him to be our strength and our stronghold in that day of trouble, he must be our strength now, today. We must know what it means to live by faith and not by sight. We must know what it means to have faith in the stronghold, which we may not visibly see, but we know that that stronghold is of eternal worth. That stronghold can never fade away. It's more powerful than anything we can see. But we must have that experience now so that we can trust him in that time, in that dark time of trouble. Now, um, also in the Bible, you know, God is a um, time, is a is a stronghold, but also cities, as we you know kind of briefly discussed, were were strongholds as well. Just quickly, if you go with me to Second um, Samuel chapter five, Second Samuel chapter five. Second Samuel chapter five, verses six, verses six, and so you know, in those days, before um, when when a nation basically takes over another nation's stronghold, then basically you know they've taken over the the that particular nation. Um, you you in in order to take over a nation, you have to take over the the subjects or the city, the subjects and the territory. Okay, so in Second Samuel chapter five, um, this is now David taking Zion from the Jebusites and then making it the capital city. So, Second um, Samuel chapter five, verse six, and the king and his men, and the king and his men, went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. So this was a challenge from the Jebusites, 
who were actually inhabiting and occupying um, Mount Zion at the time. And verse 7, nevertheless, it says, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same is the city of David. And David said on that day, whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief of the captain. And so forth. Okay. Um, verse 9. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built around about from Milo and inward and so forth. Okay. So, so David, um, in him taking over that place, he now begins to rule over it. So there's a contention or there's a contending of the strongholds. Okay. If I take over, if there's two um, powers fighting, if I, you know, um, actually, I don't want to mention any names of nations, um, but you, you get the gist. You've got Israel, you've got the Jebusites. David goes and takes over the str stronghold of the Jebusites, and now um, David rules, and that's the case. Now, the biggest stronghold that God is trying to, that, that's in this, in, in this warfare, in this great controversy, what do you, what do you think the stronghold is? It's the souls of men. Right, it's the church, but the souls of men. This is what's been contending for. Right now, now you remember the strongholds were a place where, um, a place of fortress, uh, a place of defense, a place of attack as well. It's you know a place of strategy for, um, from whoever's occupying it. Okay, for whichever purpose. Now, as we've seen, God is a stronghold. Right to those who who um, fear him, who love him, who obey him, okay? Um, but also, just to dig in with the, the idea of the stronghold being you and I, the soul, the stronghold specifically, I'm going to say, is also the mind, the, the temple, the temple. Um, if you go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, Second Corinthians chapter. Yes, I did say Second Corinthians chapter 10. Yes, verses three to five. The Bible says mm -hmm. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses three to five. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. OK, now, as we read this, remember, a lot of the Old Testament scenarios that were taking place, the histories, literal warfare, literal combat, Right, literal sword against swords, um, sword piercing flesh, literal. But we must understand its spiritual application as it applies even then and now. So even though in the Old Testament it was a literal battle, it was still spiritual battle. Right? Let us not um, forget that because even when um, God literally took the children of Israel out of Egypt and literally destroyed the armies of Egypt. God was showing a spiritual lesson of taking his people away from Satan, taking his people away from bondage and bringing them into the rest. It was a spiritual, it was a, it, it was much as it was a spiritual, I mean, literal reality. It was a spiritual reality for them at that time as well, as it's for us, as it's pointing to us. Mm. So notice, but for us, we're told that we do not war after the flesh. Why? In verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to pulling down of strongholds. Okay, so as God would lead the children of Israel or David to go and take, the, take over the stronghold of the enemy, the church is raised to do the very same thing, to advance in warfare. Right? The church really is raised and is supposed to be in active warfare to 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 take to move forward and march and took over the enemy's grounds through the leading of God as 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 Jesus was the captain of the Lord's host that appeared to Joshua in Joshua chapter 5 the the you know the captain of the Lord's host where he commands Joshua to take off his feet because where he stands the holy ground as Jesus is the same 
You read in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15, the angel of the Lord that appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And um, he tells Moses, take off your shoe for where you're standing is holy ground. And Moses asks, you know, when, if the people ask me, um, who is this God? What is his name that sent me onto you? You tell them, I am has sent you. The very same Jesus in John chapter 8 that spoke to the Jews and told them, you know, um, Abraham saw my day and he was glad. And the Jews said, you're not even 50 years old. What do you mean Abraham saw your day? And Jesus turned around and said and says to them, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is the same captain of the Lord, same captain of, uh, of the army of the Lord that's marching the church. This is the same Jesus. OK, so in verse four, we're told for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God in pulling down strongholds. Now, is God saying that we're supposed to go and tear down buildings? No. What are the strongholds? Verse five, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I love that. I love that because, you know, in ancient days when you would go and 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 take over a nation, you have captives who you bring back. OK, um, and this is what the Jews wanted. The Jews, when they said, you know, we want to uh, give us a king like the other nations, because when the other nations will go and war and take over another nation, they'll bring back, bring back captives and parade them in shame and sometimes naked and parade them. And, you know, as they're parading them through, you know, going through the gates of the city, into the city, you know, the inhabitants of the city are cheering and, and, and praising the, the king and his bravery and so forth. But um, with Jesus is, is the opposite and it's beautiful. When you read Desire of Ages, I can't remember the exact chapter. When he conquered sin and he resurrected, and when he ascended to heaven, there was a train of those who were captives under Satan. And those he led to heaven. And they were evidence. And, you know, these were the, the, the captives who, who he had freed and liberated. And he's bringing them to heaven, not as slaves to be paraded, but those who have overcome. And that's beautiful. And so here we're told that, um, you know, we're, we're given the task to what? Cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Those who are in captivity, we must bring them what? To the obedience of Christ. We must bring them to liberty. Jesus says that, you know, in Luke chapter 4, when he um, went to the temple, he's come to set the captives free. Now, if we're in the army of Christ, what are we supposed to do? We're doing what the Lord is, is commanding us to do and what he did, which is using us to what? bring those who are in captivity, those who are bruised, those who are burdened by sin, those who are in depression and shackled by guilt. Why? Because you and I who... Um, have accepted the call of Christ, we should know what, um, uh, th that experience. And because we have experienced that experience, we should know the longing and praying for those who are longing to be free. You know, um, reaching out and praying and fasting for those who are in captivity, in drugs, alcohol, um, adultery, whatever the case may be, high imagination, we're given the mandate to bring, to free those and bring them into the captivity, into the obedience of Christ, which is really freedom. Amen. So this is what Jesus came to do. And that's one thing I love about Jesus, because whatever he commands us to do, he's come to, to show us himself. He came to set the example himself. And as we looked at, you know, for the past um, few days, Jesus is moved by the law of service, the law of love, that law which is living to a minister unto others. And this is, this is why he raised the church, that 
his spirit and that love can flow through you and I as his body, because we make up the body of Christ and where that hand, where that body that he extends salvation to those who, uh, in darkness, to those who need light, to those who in prisons, to those who in um, in in seems like they're they're caged in 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 sins that seem like uh, impregnable force that nothing can get through. But the power of God, we've seen in the Old Testament, we're supposed to see in our lives, can break down any strongholds. And this is what Jesus came to the Jewish nation to to free them. But they said, we're not in bondage. We are Abraham's seed. And little did they realize as they rejected the mercy, as they rejected his pleas, they didn't realize that the, 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 the Satan was building and building and building and making them a fortress. Let me share this quote with you. Let me share this quote with you from... Um, <clears throat> Uh, okay okay let me sh share this quote with you from okay this is from desire of ages we're told when the soul surrenders itself to christ a new power takes possession of the new heart a change is wrought which man can never accomplish for himself. It is a supernatural work bringing a supernatural element into human nature. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his what? His own fortress, which he holds in a revolted world, and he intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own. A soul thus kept in possession by the heavenly agencies is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. And I say amen to that. Let me repeat that. A soul thus kept in possession of heavenly agencies is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. But unless we do yield ourselves to the control of Christ, we shall be dominated by the wicked one. We must inevitably be under the control of one or the other of the two great powers that are contending for supremacy of the world. Okay, um, this is from Desire of Ages, Desire of Ages 324.1. Desire of Ages 324, 324, pardon me, 324.1. Okay, um, apologize if you didn't see the quote but that's the reference and hopefully you heard it okay so when we are under uh when we when when Christ is abiding in this temple the Bible, you know uh, inspiration says we become an impregnable fortress to the assaults of Satan how is it that Satan can gain no access to Christ because Christ was shielded by the father Christ was in the father he abided in the father so nothing can get through to the father to the son without the permission of the father right and so christ is saying look if you abide in me as i in the father satan cannot touch you satan cannot touch you satan cannot um cause you to sin if you abide in me as i abide in the father you become an impregnable fortress um had the jews realized that they were being what's the word occupied by another spirit in fact they had opportunity to realize that um but they would not you know they would not um, humble themselves to what Christ was saying to them. And as we've been looking at for the past few days, we saw that in them converting to the way of the world, really to the way of Rome, the God of Rome was really dwelling in them. And that God was Satan. And they didn't realize that Satan was pushing them and pushing them and pushing them into a point where there would be a point of no return. And this is one of Satan's expertise 
what he does, he 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 um causes us to sin and creates a scenario where we we think we feel that we're backed up into a corner that we have there's no choice but to do his will what do i mean when you look at Saul king Saul what a sad story from how he started to where it ended up you know Saul initially was a you know was a humble man you know um when you read the accounts of him um you know, when the prophet was looking for him, he was hidden. You know, he was not proud or anything like that. But as time went on, and you had David, who um, the Lord chose, uh, you know, you see this thing, you know, growing in Saul, this rebellion growing in Saul, you know, this jealousy of David growing in Saul. And God was trying to reach Saul through the prophet but but Saul um you know relying on his own wisdom you know at times you know disobeyed God so he, he refused to listen to the prophet Samuel and then Samuel dies and David is God's anointed but Saul is persecuting David and then Saul ends up slaying the city of the priests so all the avenues that God had to reach Saul was was either you know either dead he was persecuting or he slaughtered so he continuously was walking down to a, a path of um um the unpardonable sin and eventually he gets to the place where in desperation he he goes to the witch of endor and he consults the witch of endor and the and, and the demon appears to him but if he really wanted to listen to the counsel of Saul, he should have listened to him while Saul was alive. I mean, um, Samuel was alive. And if he was humble and, and yielded to the Holy Spirit, he would not have persecuted um, David. And he definitely would not have slaughtered the city of the priests or the priests in, those, in that city. But Satan urges him, urges him and backs him to a corner where now... He, he he's listening to a message from the demon and the demon brings gloom to him and doom and destruction to him. That he prophesies destruction to him. Inspiration says he was goaded into um, despair and, and, and depression and, and destruction. When you look at Judas, Judas had how many opportunities to, to yield to Christ? You know, of all the disciples, Judas actually understood more of Christ's mis uh, ministry than all the others. And in several, in, in, in many occasions, Christ tried to keep him close to him as possible so that he could, he could um, 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 you know, by beholding, he become changed. But Judas wanted to stay just far enough and near enough that, you know, near enough, but far enough that he was not going to be converted into the ways of Christ. And eventually, you know, when um, in, in, in the situation where Christ um, rebukes him concerning um, Mary Magdalene in the washing of, of his feet and using her hair and using that, um, she was using that expensive um, perfume. And Judas made that comment, you know, that, you know, that could be given to the poor, knowing well he didn't care about the poor. And Christ rebukes him. He took that to heart. And when you read the inspiration, she tells you that um, him setting up Jesus was for two reasons. Number one, he wanted to teach this Jesus a lesson that he should be treated with due respect. Number two, he felt that if he could push Jesus, not realizing him thinking he could push Jesus, Satan was pushing him into a corner. He felt that if he could push Jesus, Jesus would force his hand and deliver himself. And when he would deliver himself, you know, um, from those who would come to arrest him, well, J Judas would be held as, you know, uh, 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 you know, a wise man in that situation. Why? Because if Jesus forced his hand, then Judas can say, well, this, this was, you know, one of my wise ploys. Um, and, you know, he'll get the credit for it. But in pushing Jesus, pushing Jesus to the corner, he didn't realize he was fulfilling prophecy. And it was not Jesus that he was pushing in the corner. 
he was himself. And when he felt um, 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 fell into that corner, what did he do? Out of guilt, he went and hung himself. Brothers and sisters, this is what Satan is seeking to do. When he possesses the soul, he wants to push us in a place where we think there's no coming back from this. And this was the lie that he said in heaven. When, when some of the angels wanted to return, he told them, listen, I'm familiar with the law of God more than all of you. I have access as the covering cherub to God's principles more than you. And where you've gone, you've gone too far. And this is why some of the angels did not return back to God. Because Lucifer told them this lie that they've gone too far. Brothers and sisters, do not let the devil tell you that you've gone too far. Do not let the devil tell you that you've gone too far. Whatever situation you might find yourself in when you think, Lord, I, I feel like I'm backed in a corner. Do not let the devil um, um, uh, gain the victory. Uh, yield yourself to God and you'll be surprised how much ways of escape the Lord has for you. And sometimes it may mean you may have to walk through that um, road of humility. It may mean you have to walk through that shame, but that is necessary for you and I because the third angel's message comes to humble man to the dust. Nothing of man will go, nothing, no pride, no high, no self-exaltation is going to make it to the heavenly Canaan. This is the time where we're supposed to be humbled. This is the time where we may have to, we may have to be on our knees. We may have to share tears. We may have to undergo ridicule. We may have to, but it's necessary for our salvation because guess what? There's a, the, 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 there's a glory be after that cross. There's a glory after that shame. So let us not um, fall for that uh, Satan's ploy and making us think we have to act according to his will we have to use his weapons because we're backed in the corner peter felt that he was backed in the corner when the the maid pointed out to him that aren't you a, a, a disciple of jesus because he felt if he, because he felt corner what did he do he began cursing and swearing let us not fall for that because that's exactly what satan is going to do even in the sunday law crisis is going to make it seem that God's people, they're going to be backed in a corner. And it's going to seem like to obey God means like I'm going to lose everything. But guess what? It's not about what you're going to lose. It's what you're gaining with the Lord. Amen. So this, these were the lessons that Christ was coming to the Jewish nation to teach. And then unfortunately, unfortunately, because... They refused the lessons of grace because they refused um, the pleas of mercy. They found themselves in a situation of the, the destruction of Jerusalem. Christ had warned that when there was to see the armies surround Jerusalem, it was time to flee. And we're told by inspiration that, you know, um, when when the um, the Roman army first surrounded Jerusalem, you know they they mysteriously withdrew, and that was signal for those who had listened to the words of Christ, you know the Christians to to come out of Jerusalem, and they did. We're told that not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem, but then the Roman army came back, and what and now they backed into a corner. The Jews are backed into a corner. Which they, which they themselves put themselves into. Now it's sad. It's sad because as we're talking about the stronghold, and we're talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, what did the Jews think their stronghold was? Didn't they not think that it was that very same temple that Jesus said would be destroyed? And it was a wonder to the to the disciples when Jesus said, "Not one stone will be left upon another." In fact, let me just share this. Um, share this screen um, oh, 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 oh. yep yeah, there we go can you see this brethren
Can you see this? Yes, we can see. Perfect, thank you. So in Great Controversy, we're going to be spending a little bit of time on here as we begin to wrap up. Great Controversy 28.1, the reference is there. In the reign of Herod, Jerusalem had not only been greatly beautified, but by the erection of towers, walls, and what? Fortresses, adding to the natural strength of his situation, it had been rendered apparently impregnable. He who would at this time have foretold publicly its destruction would, like Noah in his day, have been called a crazed alarmist. So when Jesus was actually saying that Jerusalem would, would be destroyed, it, 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 it seemed impossible. Because we're, we're told it, it, it had been rendered apparently impregnable. So going by sight, again, as we, 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 we've been discussing for the past few days, going by sight, Jerusalem seemed impregnable. Little did they realize that the fortress of Jerusalem was that man, Jesus. That man, Jesus, that carpenter's son, that was the fortress that was impregnable. But to human eyes, it doesn't make sense. It's foolishness. I'll read on. The long suffering of God towards Jerusalem only confirmed the Jews in their stubborn impenitence. In their hatred and cruelty towards the disciples of Jesus, they rejected the last offer of mercy. Then God withdrew his protection from them and removed his restraining power from Satan and his angels. And the nation was left to the control of the leader she had chosen. You know, in Revelation chapter 7, we, we read about the angels who are holding the four winds until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. And when the servants of God is sealed in the forehead, what happens? The winds are let loose and there's a time of trouble such as never was. God's restraining power is removed. And what we see in, in the destruction of Jerusalem is a type. And when God withdrew, withdraws his protection, what does it mean? It means that that restraining power from Satan and his angels are now removed and satan and his angels have total power to those subjects and we're told that the nation was left to the control of the leader she had chosen when did she choose satan to be a leader when they requested barabbas when they requested when they said um caesar is our king that's when they chose satan and they didn't realize what they were choosing and so in mercy God delays the judgment and he sends the disciples to the, to the Jews, right? Go ye to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He sends the message to the Jews and, you know, even to the children of, the, of, of those parents who said, let, our, let his blood be upon us and our children. They called this judgment down upon themselves. And then when um, God's protection, not realizing... You know that you know there's an interesting relationship between God, God's people, and the world. You know, Jesus compares, um, he says, you know, um, you are the salt of the earth. And salt is used in those days to preserve because they didn't have fridges, okay, to preserve. Now, when you look at the days of Noah. As God's people were preaching, as Noah was preaching for 120 years, and yeah, those who were later rest, who were preaching with him, but later rest before the flood came, um, you know, the destruction did not come until Noah went into the ark. When you look at the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction did not come until Lot and his family, by his wife, came out of um, Sodom and Gomorrah. Then destruction came. When you look at the the um, the um, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem did not come until the Christians had left. You know, the world does not really appreciate, um, and perhaps we ourselves don't even appreciate that. 
you know, we have a part to play in delaying the destruction of this world. We have a part to play in this. And so in the destruction of Jerusalem, before that happens, they choose their leader. God still sends his disciple. He still sends a message of mercy. He still sends a message to, to for them to turn around. But they, they chose their leader. And so God has no choice but to respect that they don't want they don't want God to dwell in them. They don't want to be a stronghold for God. Instead, they want to be a stronghold, a fortress for Satan. And I read on. Her children had spurned the grace of Christ, which would have enabled them to subdue their evil impulses, and now these became their conquerors. So in other words, without the Holy Spirit, those evil impulses, there's no restraint anymore. Whatever impulse comes to mind, they do. No restraint, no conscience. There's nothing too wicked. There's nothing too evil. Anything goes. And the very impulses which the Holy Spirit comes and, you know, and tells us to overcome that the body should be subject to the mind of Christ, you know, which is in us, etc. You know, there's no control anymore. These things now become conquerors. In fact, they're slaves to themselves. Satan aroused the fiercest, the most aroused the fiercest and most debased passions of the soul. Men did not reason. They were beyond reason, controlled by impulse and blind rage. They became satanic in their cruelty. You know, we read the news, look at the news now. We see the wickedness that's taking place. And yet still God's restraining spirit is there. Imagine when the winds are let loose. The destruction of Jerusalem is a lesson to you and I. Because this is what Satan is seeking to bring us to. This is the road, that, this is the destination that Satan wants to bring us to, to the point of no return. We're told that the rulers, um, parents slew their children and children, their parents. The rulers of the people had what? No power to rule themselves. Can you imagine that? So in other words, in other words that means they were under the control of demons. Either where we'll get to the point we're fully under the control of the Holy Spirit or we're fully possessed by demons. The rulers of the people had no power to rule themselves. Uncontrolled passions made them tyrants. The fear of God no longer disturbed them. Satan was at the head of the nation and the highest civil and religious authorities were under his sway. This is the condition of the Jews before the destruction of Jerusalem. And it's as though, I could be wrong for saying this, it's as though God allowed the Roman army to come and take them out of their misery. Because this is before even the Roman army came and slaughtered them. This was the condition of the Jews in that time. As we discussed, when Moses predicted this, or I mean prophesied this, he prophesied that, you know, the mothers will be eating their children, their babies. This was the condition of God's people. And when the Roman army came to them, where did they think their stronghold was? They felt that if they can go into the temple, they will be safe there and God will, will um, rescue them. Their stronghold was in the building. Little did they realize that the stronghold was that man that they said, crucify him. That man where, where they said, it is better that this man dies than we lose the whole nation. Not realizing that the strength of their nation was that very man. Because they went by sight. By sight, they couldn't see any strength in Jesus. They, they didn't see how, how this man hanging on the cross was really secure in the universe. They couldn't see how this man who was spat upon, who was ridiculed, who was mocked, was the strength of the nation. And they yielded themselves to the God that they wanted. Brothers and sisters, when we are approaching the Sunday law issue, it's, it's more than just the day. It is more than just, you know, um, gritting our teeth and saying, I am not going to keep Sunday. It's about who is possessing the soul. Who is ruling the soul? 
Because at that point in time, there's no hiding. At that point in time, you, you're going to reveal who is the captain of your heart, mm -hmm. who is the ruler of your heart. That's what's going to be revealed in that time. In closing, um, I was hoping I could show this, this slide, but um, for some reason it's, oops. Okay, so that's gone. Um, I was hoping I can show this slide. Um, uh, let me see if I can get it. Oops. Entire screen. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, can you can you see this? I'll try again. Yes, we can see. Can you see? Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Who knows what this is? Elmina Castle. Okay, Elmina Castle is a um, well, actually it was a it's a fortress and a slavehold in um, in Ghana. Okay. Um, I happened to visit there with my um, wife because she's from Ghana and we went with her family and this is one of the tourist tourist places we go to, which is Elmina Castle. And you can see there's cannons there. Um, so it was a place of defense, but it's a place where um, the Portuguese, the Dutch, and I think the British would keep slaves before shipping them over to the New World or to the South Americas or to North America or to the Caribbean. And <clears throat> in Elmina Castle, um, you have, what they'll do, they'll keep um, the slaves there for a number of months. I can't exactly remember how many months, but um, when they would capture, you know, um, some of these slaves from the mainland, where the indigenous people actually capture some of the slaves or um, bring some of the slaves which they had as um, conquered through internal or tribal war, etc. Um, in their dealings with the Portuguese or, the, you know, these powers, they would trade. And some of these slaves were kept and held in Elmina Castle, like a dungeon. It's, you know, when you go there, it's a very sad, sad place. And in fact, which was actually quite disturbing was there was a church, you know, the Portuguese used to have a church right above it and while they would do church services they were you know slaves that were you know kept there and when they would bring in these um slaves you know the tour guide would explain that some of these guys were you know big strong men burly men but obviously after months to be kept in that situation or degradation they will um reduce in size and they'll go weak you know, and a lot of things were done to basically kill the spirits of anybody trying to rebel. And so as time goes on, they become weaker and weaker and weaker. And this door here was called the door of no return. Now, there's a picture I have where I stand um, actually near it. I'm not a big guy, I'm quite slim. So by the time they were able to, you know, go through that door, so... They, they would have lost, you know, substantial amount of weight. And from this door, they would be taken to small boats and then taken to ships, which would then tr transport the slaves um, through the Atlantic to, um, to, again, to the Caribbean or the Americas. And this door was called the door of no return because once you went through that door, there was no there was no coming back to your um, homeland again. That's why it was called the door of no return. Now, this really is a, is an illustration of what Satan is seeking to do with the soul. To weaken us, weaken us and weaken us and take us to the point of no return. That's his strategy to take us to the point of no return, no turning, no repentance. 
blaspheming of the Holy Spirit and receiving the mark. And he can do with us as he will. That's what Satan wants to do. But on the other hand, and we thank God, God also is seeking to take us to the place of no return. A place of no return where we are sealed. Sealed with the seal of the living God. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. Sealed that um, Satan can come and find nothing in us. We're told that there's going to be people uh, who are going to go through a time of trouble such as never was. And Satan is going to throw everything at them. But guess what? They will be a fortress. They will be a fortress. And um, the last quote I'm going to read um, is from the book OFC 162.4. I'm not able to um, put this on the screen, but just write, write this down. OFC 162.4. I love this quote. I really, really love this quote. Um, and I'd like to share this with you as we close. It says, the Lord Jesus is making experiments on human hearts through the exhibition of his mercy and abundant grace. He is affecting transformation so amazing. Now catch this. He's affecting transformation so amazing that Satan stands viewing them as a fortress impregnable to his sophistries and delusions. Amen. They are to him an incomprehensible mystery. The angels of God look on with astonishment and joy that fallen men, once children of wrath, are thought, excuse me, once children of wrath, are through the training of Christ, developing characters after the divine similitude to be sons and daughters of God, to act an important part in the occupations and pleasures of heaven. Amen. Amen. God is affecting transformation. She says that it's so amazing that Satan is viewing them as a fortress impregnable to his sophistries and delusions. This is what God is doing for you today. That the, if the, the, the work of transformation is doing to you, is to make you an impregnable fortress. And he says, she says that they are to him, Satan, an incomprehensible mystery. It's a mystery. How is it fallen man? Because we are the last of generations. We are the worst of generations. And God has left the best for last. He's using the worst of the worst to show the glory of his power. He's using the worst of generations to show the mystery of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's showing the worst of the worst. And the angels are looking on this with joy and an astonishment. That, he's, that fallen men, you and I, with all our failings, with all our failures, with all our issues, with all our faults, through the training of Christ, we're developing characters after divine similitude to be sons and daughters of God, to take part in, uh, to, to act an important part in the occupations and the pleasures of heaven. Amen. This is the door of no return that God is seeking to take us in. And I pray that, um, I pray that this is also our desire, that we yield to him irrespective of what it looks like, irrespective if it seems like we're backed into a corner, let us allow the Lord to do his work in us. Let us, let, let us yield so that God can do that finishing work in us, that we're sealed with his seal, never, never to be overrun again, never to be overtaken again, but fully in the control of God, that God can do exploits through us that we can do his work of conquering and conquering and bringing captives into the fold of Christ. Amen. 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 Yes, that, that place, Amen. place in Ghana, that prison, uh, we've been there. We, we actually, we, we can see what you're saying. We've seen the door of no return. Amen. Oh, uh, actually, yeah, I remember, remember going to see it, and the church on top, and just yes, by yeah. the sea, and the, the the conditions were really bad. The little rooms, dark, dark, no light there. 
Yeah, it was, it was and horrible. And the ceilings place. were low, weren't they? Low ceilings. We didn't have any problems, but some of the people at Withers did. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was a horrible place, and uh, it, you can see who, who ran that place, Satan. So we'd like to thank you for that timely message. And the devil does try and tell you you've gone too far. You had no hope. That's what he told the angels. The third, the third of the angels that, that fell with him, they'd still got a chance, but he told them they hadn't. And they and, believed um, him. And they believed him. Sad. So you, you, when Satan talk, talks to, tries to talk to you and tell you you've got no chance, then remind him of his future. So we'd like to thank you again for that um, that message. We're going to sing a song called Are You Ready For Jesus To Come? We've adapted the second verse to suit the message. The theme of the Bible is Jesus. Charlene, are you able to close in prayer for us, please? Sure. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful message, Lord, that we know that there's still hope, Lord. We just have to cling to you, Father, and know that 
We don't want to go through that door of no return. We don't want our souls to be given to the devil, Lord. We pray earnestly, pleading for your help, Lord. If without you we are lost, Father, we are lost, and we will not go. Have come, there will be no return for us, Lord. We're pleading for the Holy Spirit, Lord, that we can do your work. And if our souls are lost, how can we save other souls, Lord? So today we are pleading for you to help us, Lord. Help those that are struggling with feeling that there's no return for them, Lord, feeling that their sins are so great and what they have done, their guilt, Lord. Help them to know that you are still there. Your hand, your hand is outstretched still, Lord, but we have to take hold of that hand. Help us, Lord, as we continue our life's journey before you come, that we'll give all to you, Lord, all those little sins that we don't want to give up, small things, big things, Lord, things that we're struggling with that seem so small. We have to give them up, Lord, but we need your help, Lord. We want to lead others into the fold, Lord, and help the, help your kingdom to grow because we all just want to be there on the sea of glass. We want others, Lord, to join us, our neighbors, our, our colleagues. We're praying for all of them, Lord, people we come into contact with, Lord, that they can see your beauty and the hope that you have. You stretch out your beautiful hands. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you for the prayer, Sister Charlene, and thank you again for the message, and Elder Bright. We've certainly been blessed, um, and we look forward to tomorrow evening's message. It's the last one, the last in, the one series, in the series, but I'm sure we'll be, have, be having more soon um, from uh, Elder Bright. Um, at 4.45, it will be morning prayer. 5.30, Desire of Ages. 12 o'clock midday prayer, 6.30 song service, followed by the last in the series um, from Elder Bright. So, and don't forget, all roads lead to... Um, Kevin Lee. Kevin Lee, I was going to say Rome, but it's nice, Kevin Lee. The 23rd <laughs> to the 20, 29th of December for our winter retreat. So have a nice evening, everyone, and see you all later by God's grace. Good night. Oh, good evening, all. Good night. Good evening. Good evening, brethren.